everybody, it's that Sunday School Girl of that SundaySchoolGirl.com. Welcome to the lesson for this Sunday, September 10th. I hope that you had a fantastic week. I don't have any real complaints, except those holidays on Monday kind of throw my body clock off a little bit. You know, you've, you've had such a great time, that extra day to be lazy and just enjoy yourself. And then on Tuesday, it's like, hey, kick in the gear. We got to go back to the regular world here, real life. But it was a great week. I got a lot done and I've actually traveled today. So tonight I greet you from Richmond, Virginia, where I am here as the guest of Dr. Sherry Johnson and the Department of Women of the Virginia Fourth Jurisdiction of the Church of God in Christ. Their leadership conference is tomorrow and I am a guest and I will leave here tomorrow evening and head back to Kansas. And if you happen to be in the Olathe, Kansas area, I invite you to join me Sunday at the New Hope Church of God in Christ, where I will be the guest of Superintendent Terry Bradshaw and Sunday School Superintendent Anthony Thomas in their annual Sunday School Day. So it's a full week for me, full weekend for me, and I'm sure that you have great things planned too. But here it comes. You knew it was coming. Shameless plug. I need you to make sure that you have intentionally planned to make Sunday School part part of the schedule for the weekend. If you are new around here, welcome. You have just joined the largest community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web, and I'm glad that you're here in our cyber class. I have been amazed that our numbers are now topping 5,000 people who study unique watches of this video, who study this lesson with us. And so we are growing, we are learning God's word, and that's what this is all about. And we do these videos, number one, to encourage you to make Sunday school part of your regular weekend routine. Secondly, when you get there, I don't want you just in the room taking up space and sucking up air. I need you to contribute. You're going to be part of the discussion and the dialogue and making your class great. But most of all, when you leave, we're going to understand how to activate God's word in our everyday lives. Studying this word is not just about amassing knowledge, but we should be different when we go out and affect and impact the places that we live, work, and serve. So that's why we do what we do. I'm going to ask you to make sure that you hit the subscribe button so that you don't miss anything when it comes out on this channel and make sure that you have your notification set so that you get emails immediately when content is posted. I really only have one, actually two announcements that I'll share today. One is kind of a celebration. So everyone who uh, was on the initial shipment for your fall quarterly TSSG box has received those. The feedback has been phenomenal. I wish I had one here in Virginia. I would show it to you. Uh, but I, there are some pictures posted on my social media. So you can check Instagram and you can check Facebook if you want to know what was in the box. But there is a custom t-shirt. This is all around the theme of covenant for this quarter. So the t-shirt um, is either white or black. Um, and it's got a gold metallic design that says covenant and it's got a great scripture on it. And then I think one of the most fun items was a set of coasters, four coasters that had four different memory verses on them. So um, on, I think, Monday or Tuesday of this week, there were like four boxes left and I posted and immediately I think three of them were purchased. So uh, if you look out there and you want to buy one, whatever is out there is all that's left. And I'm telling you that orders are open now for the, the winter quarterly box, which will go out in November. You want to get on the list early because once we get to the end and sales close, we're moving on to the next project. So again, check it out. If you want to see if that last box is available for you and it's your size, you'll want to go ahead and grab it. So I hope that all of you who have received your boxes are smiling and enjoying everything that was in it that reminds us of God's covenant. I also want to say this, 30 ways in 30 days has gone public. What does that mean? It means that if you were not a part of the inaugural class of top teachers to go through 30 ways in 30 days, you can now go to the website and there is a way for you to uh, be a part of that training curriculum. It's available for purchase. And so, so many teachers already this week have said, yes, I want to join. And if you go ahead and sign up for it within 12 hours, and it's usually happening within the hour, you're getting your access login so that you can start those videos and you can get through your 30 
30 days at your pace. So if you're interested, if you are a teacher, a superintendent, a Christian education leader, and let me go back, superintendents, it is a great tool to use with your teachers. If you're doing a staff meeting or staff training, it is great to use in that setting. You might use a few of the clips together and it can raise some discussion and dialogue in your meeting. So it's out there. You should check it out. It is still a secure website. So once you make your purchase, again, you get the email that gives you access to 30 ways in 30 days. You don't have to take my word for it just because I get excited about this, but you can also take a look on that sundayschoolgirl.com and there's a new testimonials page or a refreshed page where teachers who went through the 30 days, 30 ways in 30 days program talked about their experience and gave just headlines and highlights about what they thought about the program. So again, don't take my word for it. Go out and see what others are saying and I promise you it is going to be a blessing. So check it out. It's on the website and you will be blessed. Listen, I'm going to get into the lesson so that I can get a little rest for tomorrow morning. Here we go. Our lesson title is Circumcision. The Bible basis is Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 through 14. The Bible truth. God promised to give Abram the land and make him a great nation, starting with the birth of his own. Abram's descendants would be as numerous as the stars. Our memory verse is verse 10. And the lesson aim is that we will explore God's promise to Abraham, appraise the value of outward signs for God's people, and develop ways to walk blamelessly before God. So I told you all last weekend that my family was on their way. When I finished the video, I was excited that they'd be in in a few hours. And my niece and my nephew both had birthdays last weekend. So one was Friday and one was Saturday. And the decision had been made that to celebrate their birthdays, one thing that we would do as a family would be to go to the water park on Saturday in Dallas. And so the children knew this. They knew it while they were home packing. And so when they were packing, of course, they wanted to make sure to bring all of their swim gear and goggles and inflatables and all these things. And when they were driving down, it was the conversation. And uh, my baby niece was FaceTiming me. And that's all she talked about was going back to this particular water park. When we woke up on Saturday morning, the only question on the floor was, do we put our swim clothes on now or are we going to take them with us? And we actually had breakfast. My aunt and uncle hosted us at their home for a wonderful breakfast. And the adults wanted to sit around and kind of enjoy each other and just kind of exhale after the breakfast. But of course, the children were wholly obsessed with when are we leaving to go to the water park. And so whereas they enjoyed the food, immediately they were excited saying, is it time to go? Why were they this excited? Because they had received the promise of going to a water park and so their expectation was set high and it was focused on getting to the water park. What we know is that waiting can be hard and this week we are looking at a man who has a promise and he has waited a long time on his promise from God and it seemed like nothing about this promise was coming to pass. Nothing in his life looked like the promise and it was taking a really, really long time for these pieces to come together. That's what we're looking at in this story of Abraham. Now we're continuing to talk about covenant. We're going to talk about that all quarter. Now we talked last week about what a covenant was and covenants, just so you'll know, are different than contracts. Contracts are actually agreements between two parties where there is offer, consideration, acceptance, and promises are exchanged. That's the, that's the basis of it. Yes, I feel like a first year law school student saying that. An offer where one of the parties promises to do something or to refrain from doing, doing something uh, or some specific action in the future. Consideration means giving up something of value in exchange for that promise or action or non-action. Acceptance means that the offer was accepted and everyone understood what was going on. And you can accept a promise by your words, by your deeds, or actually by performance. And then there was mutuality, the basically a meeting of the minds. Again, regarding that agreement, it means that both parties understood the basic agreement of that contract, the substance of it. And if one party fails to keep its promise, then that contract is no longer any good. If either party does something to violate that contract, it is considered a broken agreement. And the whole contract becomes null and void. And basically the signers of the contract are holding up their end of the bargain as long as the other side is holding up theirs. 
But a covenant, on the other hand, is an agreement. And it's an agreement where two people are bound and they're bound by some sort of sign or symbol with each other. And we talked last week about God's covenant being unilateral, where there was really not much that he was asking other people to do. We're going to see something different this week in parts of this covenant. But that can't be broken. It is eternal. It's everlasting. Now, we're talking about circumcision this week, and that's a big conversation. In fact, I know 15 minutes is just enough to be dangerous, but it may not be enough time to exhaust circumcision because it's really not something we talk necessarily about a lot in our culture. Uh, it's not an everyday conversation, I'll put it that way. And it's interesting about uh, when you think about why God would command something so drastic from people that he loved. And so we're going to get into that. So as we go into chapter 17, uh, you should note this, that Abraham at this point is 99 years old. Now, he was 86 when he had a son. You have to go back a few chapters for this, but he's 86 when he has a son with his handmaiden, Hagar. He's got this promise. He's going to have a son. It's not happening quickly enough. His wife is like, hey, you know what, handmaiden, we can get this all done. Maybe she's the one. Let's just do it that way. And so he has this son. And at the time of our lesson, his son is about 13 years old. 13 years have gone by. And at about 13, Ishmael, who is the son, would have been entering into manhood. It's about the time he would start thinking about his own family. And it is at that time that God appears to Abraham or Abram at the time and says, oh yeah, you have a promise, but it's not coming through this particular son. I'm going to bless you through your seed, but this is not the one. And he finds out that this covenant does not apply to Ishmael because Ishmael is the child of his flesh and not the child of his faith. Now, again, it's been about 13 years since God has even met with Abram. Um, he was 75 when he went into the promised land in chapter 12, and he's really been trying to get things right for like 24 years and he's been caught up in all kinds of family dramas and trying to work things out on his own and figure out you know how his life is supposed to go and then again his home life is frustrated when his wife Sarah sees that she's not having children and says that this whole handmaiden thing is a good plan again we see a lot of him taking matters into his own hand and you know really God had it all in control the entire time um, it was a lot and God just wanted him to trust him. And so at this time, Abram is dwelling in a tent. He's living in a tent between Bethel and Ai. And he really is just supposed to be there trusting God in a place of worship. Now, verse 1 is basically what is called a theophany, meaning it is an appearance of God to Abram at this time. Now, you have to note that this is not God's first time meeting Abram. In fact, it's like his fifth time. Um, and there is no record that God has spoken to him since Ishmael was born. So it's been silent. Again, it's been 13 years. And here the Lord appears to him and he says, I am the almighty God. And then he says, there are three things that you need to do. You need to walk before me and be perfect. And he's going to tell him later to keep his covenant. We'll get to that. So again, even though he's almost 100 years old, God is saying to him, I am God, I am the Almighty God, and I've made you a promise. I am El Shaddai. That's the first time we see this name of God in the Bible, meaning that God is starting to reveal himself to Abraham. He's starting to show himself, saying that you've been trying to figure all this stuff out, and the truth is, I am sufficient. I am all that you need. In other words, here God starts to set expectations that I am all that you need. I don't need you to get nervous. I don't need you to try to figure this out. I don't need you to try to create, create your own plan. I just need you to walk before me and be perfect, and you're going to keep this covenant with me. That's all he wants is for Abraham to be totally and completely sold out and dependent on him. As you're going through this lesson, I need you literally to take a pen or a highlighter, and I want you to look for certain sets of words. I want you to look for the words and count how many times you see I will or the word will. Look for the words my covenant and look for the words everlasting. And you'll see that there are refrains as we go through this, which means that it's important. So it's been 25 years again since God has made any this promise to Abraham. And he wanted him to know despite your disappointment, despite your not knowing how things were going to work, if you do your part, I'm going to do mine. And God basically outlines 
three parts of this covenant. There's his part, there is Abraham's part, and then the non-printed part of our text talks about Sarah's part. Abraham, in addition to walking before God and in addition to being upright before him, he was going to have to have a mark or a brand or a sign that he belonged to God. And he was going to have to live out his life in a way that was representative of that sign that would physically be marked on his body. This is nearly a 100 year old man who is receiving a promise at 100 years old that he, his seed is going to be multiplied greatly. Abraham's response was to fall on his face. When God spoke to him, his, his actual response was worship. It was worship for who God is and out of respect for who he is. And so God meets him in a different way. And Abraham is meeting God in a new way, not just for what God could do, not just his promises and things that he could do, but actually starting to understand God and his character and his nature. God is always who he was and he's always known what he knows about himself. But this was all new to Abraham, but it was not new to God. So again, his natural response, his action, his attitude, just like last week without being prompted. Remember Noah, when he came out of the ark without being prompted, God had given him direction up until that time for everything else. But his response to God was worship. And we see the same thing with Abraham, that he falls on his face and he worships. And notice when we see people fall in worship in the Bible, we don't see people, see people fall backwards in worship. They fall forward in worship. And so um, this is a very um, undignified response, if you will. But again, it was the giving of himself totally to God. And then God tells him more. At this moment, things are really beginning to change because it's impossible to have this kind of encounter with God and things still be the same. So God says, I'm going to do these things. I'm going to make this happen. It's my covenant. It's not based on anything that you do or even whether you're obedient or faithful. It's an act of God's choosing. It's an act of his own will and his faithfulness to extend and to make this covenant. He initiates it. He establishes it. He determines the terms for it. He ratifies it. It is God's covenant to give. The next thing we see is that God gives him a name change. All of us were called something before, but since God has changed you, what does he call you now? And here he says, you're no longer called Abram or exalted father. Interesting that a man who actually had no children was called an exalted father. But he changed his name to Abraham, Abraham, meaning exalted father of many multitudes or many descendants. Again, a name for a man who today at 100 years old almost had no children. But God knew what would be accomplished through him, even if others, Sarah, found it laughable. He says, I'm going to make you fruitful. And it's not just going to be your descendants, but you're going to have kings that come out of you. You, this simple guy who dwells in this tent between these two places, this kind of greatness is coming out of you. And again, he talks about this covenant, which is really important. And there are three parts that he's establishing, or he outlines in this covenant. That's a better way to put it. He outlines three parts, that he would be the father of many nations. In other words, he was going to multiply Abraham's seed. Secondly, he says, I will be a God to you. I am going to promise you my blessing. Lastly, there is a land promise here. It's an everlasting possession of land. Look for the word everlasting. I told you you're going to see that a couple of times in this text. Uh, and you actually see it in Genesis chapter 13, verse 15, where this land is being promised forever. It, he says that I'm giving you a land in which you are a stranger to possess it forever. And you'll find later in scripture that there is conflict over land and issues over land. And ultimately when that land is divided, it is divided among his descendants. And he says, I will be your God again, ensuring his blessing. And we know that all of this comes through Isaac, through Jacob, through Jacob's uh, 12 sons, and ultimately down through the lineage to Jesus Christ. And God says, I, you know, your job is to keep my covenant. You stand with it, stay firmly with it. And it's not necessarily that this is going to be an easy thing to do. Uh, before it was God talking about everything that he was going to do. Now he starts to outline the things that 
Abraham would have to do. He says that you have to do your part. This is not just easy street. Here are the things that you're going to do. And this is the first time that Abraham has something to do. You are to keep my covenant. And you continue to hear me say that because it's important. Why is it important? Because if he failed to keep the covenant, there were consequences. And that consequence was what? Being cut off. If he was not keeping elements of the covenant, that meant that he was lacking submission. And that would equal to him not walking before the Lord. And so anything other than keeping the covenant would be disobedience. Now, every covenant has a sign. Last week, the sign of the covenant with Noah, when the um, sign appeared in the heavens, his sign was a rainbow. Here, the sign this week is the title of our lesson is circumcision. Now, I'm sure that Abraham had to be like, hey, God, uh, Noah got a rainbow. What's up with this? What's with this circumcision? God told him that every male would have to be circumcised. Their sign would be circumcision, the removal of flesh from the body with a rugged flint knife. Super painful. He had to circumcise himself, and he had to circumcise every male child in his home, those that were born in, that were, those that would be bought in, but everyone as a sign of that covenant. That was a sign that they were receiving the covenant. Why circumcision? Why such a, a painful and bloody process? Well, it was a sign of putting away of the flesh and no longer trusting in the flesh. Again, his entire household, children born at eight days old, would have to be circumcised. And this was a symbol of their new identity, a symbol where God would separate those who he considered his possession. They would be his people and he would be their God. They would be the people through which he would bring change and correction for what happened way back in the Garden of Eden when man was separated from him. Even think about it in Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, when they sowed fig leaves, what was the part of the body that Adam covered up? It was his loins. And so, so much comes from that area. It was an area of intimacy. It's the area of reproduction. But God says that that is the marked area that would separate those who would have that symbol, that identity, that brand that says they belong to me. I thought it was interesting that God would uh, call for this sign in that area, the area from which Abraham was supposed to be blessed, that that is the reproductive area. And from that very area, he required that type of sacrifice, that type of sign. And again, this covenant was marked with blood. That's important. Again, why circumcision? Because it was impacting the most intimate part of a man. So circumcision happened in the intimate part of a man and it was an ever-present visual reminder put on a part of a man that he would never forget. So this was very, very personal. And again, those who rejected circumcision in essence rejected the covenant. And the circumcision was only good if honestly there was circumcision of the heart, if you go back to verse one, that was really what God wanted from Abraham in the beginning was that relationship. It was him to trust him for him to know, Abraham, I have this all under control. I know it's not going your way. I know you don't understand it, but I've got it under control. Here are my key learnings from this week's lesson. The first thing I noticed is that Abraham has gone through a long process. He's almost 100 years old and he's holding on to a promise that he's had for nearly 25 years. But what we know is that when God promises something, he is able to perform it. But it gets tough in there. The truth is, there are things that a lot of us are waiting on or that we believed for or that we believed our lives would go in certain ways and we don't have those things yet. But our job is to trust that God knows and that God is faithful to what he has spoken and promised in our lives. The second thing is that God uses simple people to accomplish his purpose. And when God reveals himself to us, we get the complete picture then of who he is. And it's then that we best understand him and understand his expectations for us. He wants to reveal to us who he is, not just the things that he can do for us. He doesn't want us just to be caught up in the stuff, but he wants us to know him. And he wants us to commit ourselves, all of, our, all of ourselves, wholly to him. He wants all of you. 
God changes people. And there were things in Abraham that had to be shifted so that they focused on God and not just the things that he could make happen, but trusting wholly, knowing that God was sufficient. He is El Shaddai. Next, God makes covenant, not because he has to, but he does it because he loves us and because he wants relationship with us. Lastly, our faith is not built overnight, but we gain our faith and we grow our faith as we go through this process that is called life. So that's the lesson for this week. I look forward to anything that you all have gotten out of the lesson. Please leave me comments below and let me know uh, points that you'll either share if you're a teacher or if you're a student and you studied things that left out to you. I would love to see your notes down in the comments so that we all continue to share and learn together. You all have a super, super fantastic, wonderful rest of the weekend. And I will see you in Sunday school. Bye, everybody.